humans have always been able to ask the question why, but science is one of the few systems that humans have figured out that deals with the questions how. And not many people ever really learn about what science is. So I want to preface all of this by talking just briefly about science. It is a process of asking questions about what and how. It makes experiments using strict controls and large samples. These are very crucial. And you have to define what you're dealing with. And whatever you get, you have to analyze it statistically. But your findings have to be repeatable. Either you repeat it or other people will independently verify. So it has to be consistent. And you usually, I mean, you have to publish it in peer review. That means everyone gets to tear it apart. <laughs> and this happens also on websites now. And the fascinating thing about science, unlike any other human endeavor, science is subject to revision. It's self-correcting. And my major professor, my dear friend, Ken Norris, who taught at Santa Cruz with me for years and years and years, or I taught with him, said science is just a set of rules to keep us from lying to each other. And I never forgot that definition. Plus, science is collaborative. Of my few scientific journal publications, I think most of them are collaborative because I sought that out. That means you work together and you usually share the credit. Now, one thing that I said, science is correcting and science advances. When something new is found out, doesn't mean everyone accepts it. The cell theory, that there were germs and the antibiotics would work against them. How could you believe in something you couldn't see? And this is what Pasteur and, and all the early microscopists and this DNA, this is in the 1950s. I remember this when I was a kid, the structure of DNA. And most people still don't really understand it. But we since have figured out ways of uh, understanding it down to the nucleotide level. And I'll talk about a couple of others. Epigenetics, which uh, you probably have never heard of, the horizontal gene transfer, which makes our microbiota very active in making us who we are. We are not just ourselves. And this microbiome elucidation has been all within the last 20 years, almost all. So let's define, science defines. You take all the microorganisms in a particular environment or a particular body, and if you could analyze them and count them and everything, that would be your microbiome. It also uh, entails all the genes of the microorganisms living in us. We are not just ourselves. We are, now I don't wanna say infected, we have cousins, <laughs> we are accompanied by bacteria, by fungi, by archaea, which are ancient, ancient bacteria. Algae, that's not really true with us. <laughs> but proteins, uh, which are protozoan, protozoans and worms. <laughs> so I want to describe what it is. How many are there? How diverse? Where does it come from? What does it do for us? And is everyone the same? Does it change? Can it be made more beneficial or corrected? And these are our, what I will call commensals. They are symbionts. They live with us. We benefit them. They benefit us. So to understand it, and don't worry to, so much about this, and certainly don't worry about the names. You can look that up. But bacteria and old bacteria and viruses were covered and invaded. I don't want to say invaded. Throughout our body in places you wouldn't expect. We have fungi living with us, and we may even have protists, that is, sometimes worms, sometimes little amoebas. And we don't know much about them, but they are there with us. 
So if you could count everything, there are 10 times more microorganisms in us than there are human cells in the body. So think about that. <laughs> we are not alone. We are mostly bacteria and viruses and fungi. And all of this collectively, what does it do for us? We probably could not survive without it. We can make baby mice that are absolutely sterile. They're taken out by C-section, put in an incubator, everything is sterile. They've never encountered bacteria. And then we just give them sterilized food and they can't survive. We have to give them bacteria. So in essence, it's a separate organ and it connects to the brain, which is even more phenomenal. You've had a gut feeling, well, this supplies your brain. You've heard of serotonin, which is our mood enhancer, which communicates in the brain, but 90% of it is made in our gut. So you can have a gut feeling. And if you just analyze the genes, there are more genes in these microbes by a factor of 100 than we have in our body. And these genes produce things for us. And these genes are exchanged between the microorganisms, but they affect the expression of our own genes. So we're talking about symbiosis. That means two species, in this case, 200 million species living within us, and both of us benefit, all of us benefit. So that's mutualism. You know what parasitism in is. One benefits the other and is harmed. I just wanna give acknowledgement to previous scientists and where did cells come from? Well, cells have cells within them. Modern cells that really evolved have other cells inside them. And this guy, Ivan Wallum, discovered first Lynn Margolis, who was a popularizer of science, who forwarded this idea, wrote several books about the symbiosis. And she also, at one time, was married to Carl Sagan. And I knew her at Berkeley. He was a Miller Fellow at Berkeley. She later went to the University of Boston uh, and has since passed on, but a wonderful, dynamic, interesting woman, and her children keep going. What she said and what probably happened, this is a cell, and it eats this other little bacteria. Well, they kind of make a Faustine deal. I won't eat you <laughs> if you do something for me. And so this little bacteria says, if you don't eat me, I'll make energy for you. How's that? And they decided this is a good situation. And so this little thing is in all advanced cells other than bacteria, and it makes our energy. So it started way, way, way back when. This is called endosymbiosis. This is called the mitochondria. All the sugar we eat eventually ends up there and it breaks it apart bit by bit and makes chemical energy for us. Now, later, this thing must have gotten hungry and ate another kind of bacteria, a bacteria that had chlorophyll inside of it. And it said, ha, I'm not going to eat you either if you can make the sugars directly for me. Wow. So here's one that makes the sugar. Here's one that breaks the sugar down. And here's the big benefit. So when you look at a plant or algae, it's already one, two, endosymbiotic commensal organisms in it. Now, I'll give you this little thing. A termite can't eat wood, but it can be digested by all of its little bacterial helpers and protist helpers inside. So this little termite, it has three species on the surface to help its symbionts move around. And then it has two internal ones 
that act like mitochondria. So this thing is already made up of massive numbers of five different species, three species of bacteria and two of, we don't know what exactly they are. So nothing is alone. And everything is made up of these kind of social networks. The dirt is. Many of you have heard about the communities of fungus that talk back and forth to trees. One tree is hurt, the other one sends nutrition for it. And there are some fabulous books. You can't just plant a pine tree. You have to put some fungus, what's called mycorrhizae. So we are a superorganism. Now, there can be certain animals that live in such complex ways, we have to consider them as superorganisms and human societies are. We don't live alone. And we are basically superorganisms, humans with our microbiota. This brings new questions, unfortunately. <laughs> what is the self? <laughs> Where did these come from? Is everyone the same? And so on. And this is a fun book. It's not strictly dealing with the microbes, but it does in a broad sense. And he's also a wonderful writer, Ed Young, I Contain Multitudes, which is a quote from Walt Whitman. Now, briefly, I have to talk about how life works. I hate the term central dogma, but that's what it's called. And all of our genes are in DNA but those are in our nucleus. So every once in a while, we make a Xerox of part of our DNA, send it outside into the cytoplasm of our cell, and it attaches to a little thing called a ribosome. Here are ribosomes. And what that ribosome does is it takes this little Xerox, here's the Xerox, which is called messenger RNA. Don't worry about all these details. But what it does is it's like a recipe and it puts the information together to make proteins. So DNA makes RNA and RNA attaches to a ribosome that makes all the protein for us, most of it, which is enzymatic or structural. But the ribosome is made up of two different parts. There's a small unit there. This is the small unit. Don't worry about the details, but it has its own nucleic code. And here's one of the advances is we can take a little piece of RNA and put it in an automatic sequencer. This used to be long, major laboratory work and RNA was harder than DNA. Now there are automatic sequencers, big companies that make this and they read back in light interpretation. So we can sequence RNA. So here's Carl Wirth, he knew that ribosomes are universal to living organisms. They differ in their sequences. So what he did is he analyzed the RNA, the ribosomes, from everything he could find, all right? Now you have all encountered some sort of tree of life and Darwin even sketched out a little funny one. And because this is our analogy, we look out there and we see trees. So. It must be a tree of life. Well, this is what Carl Wurst did. This was not a happy development for most people, okay? There are rocks, there are animals, there's vegetables. No, sorry. There are ancient bacteria, and they're very old. Archaea, they're so old. There are bacteria, and look at all of these. <laughs> oh, and then there are the rest. True cells that have a true membrane bound nucleus. And if you follow this up, you might see a little thing that says animals and it might say humans. So when we look at this, we're not that important in the evolution of life. We're an afterthought. And this is where everything happened down here. This was reanalyzed. Of course, this is what scientists do. I'm going to do what you did, use all your directions because you published the directions and I'm gonna do it again with better equipment and bang, this is what was developed by Laurie Hook. <laughs> it, this is mind boggling. It's also mind boggling because all of these things, no one had ever seen them before. And they are new because we can't grow them. 
And some of these guys, we can grow in a culture. We can't keep them alive any other way. And so we really don't know what bacteria are like except in cultures. Well, we can't grow these. <laughs> so we really don't know what's inside of us because we can't look at them except by stealing their RNA and analyzing it and saying, oh, we've never seen this before. Now, as I mentioned, we're made up of these ancient bacteria and modern bacteria, and we're made up of parasites, and we're made up of fungi, viruses, bacteria, archaea, and fungi, and some parasites. So you never have to feel alone. And if you listen very carefully, you'll hear them grinding away, chemically and just digesting everything inside of them. So briefly, just going to talk a little bit about what prokaryotes are. That is, most of these are bacteria. There is bacteria. These are the old bacteria. These are the proteins. These are plants with chlorophyll and structure. And then there's fungi, which are very, very different. Then the animals. And then somewhere way, 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 way down here would be humans. Don't worry. We still think we're really important. We do have some of these ancient bacteria in us, and most of them are here. This is the colon. This is what we call the gut. We have this whole thing from here to there is 30 feet. You don't ever want to pull it out and measure it. Trust me, I have, uh, but it's, 30 feet long. This thing is where most of the absorption takes place and a lot of the digestion. Not in the stomach, not in the small intestine, but here. And this is where most of our microbiota is. And much of it is archaea. And one of the interesting things about archaea is they can take carbon and hydrogen and oxygen to make methane out of it. And you know that because sometimes we have to let the methane out of us and other things called endols and scatols and so on. Now, we're interested in two things. What is normal? A normal, healthy intestine. How many different thousands of these things are there? And sometimes these things change. And this is called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis means our microbiome is out of balance. And if it's out of balance, we might have unpleasant bacteria and it might cause inflammation. And we now are realizing that significant number of our diseases result from the dysbiosis of bacteria in our mouth, in our gut, in our stomach, no, everywhere, even on our skin. That's remarkable. Now, this comes as a surprise. When I read that, I said, I don't understand this because a very brilliant guy who was an enterologist down in Australia kept dealing with people with peptic ulcers. And he actually took some fluid out of the stomach and he found Helicobacter pylori, which is a lovely, nasty little thing that swirls and swirls. And there were so many of them that they would eat into the stomach lining. Well, he said, I'm going to treat ulcers with antibiotics. But you remember, ulcers are caused by stress. That damages the stomach lining. He said, no, it's too much of this bacteria. Too much. Remember that. So what did he do? He drank a bottle full of it, of H. pylori. He got ulcers. And then, brilliant scientist, he took antibiotics and cleared up his ulcers. And he won the Nobel Prize for this. This was a dysbiosis. This is not natural to have so many helicobacter pylories there. Now, doesn't matter where you look. This is the fascinating thing. Every region of the body has microbiota your nose, your hair, your skin, the vaginal canal, and think how many infections are there, most of them caused by dysbiosis 
of these things, the esophagus, the stomach, and then the colon, as well as the small intestine. And these are some of the diseases we now suspect produce dysbiosis. Obesity, diabetes, inflammatory bowel. You've heard of these things now, including psychiatric disorders, perhaps autism. And there's a lot of information that suggests that autism may be a dysbiosis of the gut. So here's a look at the different microbiota. Don't worry about the details. The face is different and the ear is different. The crease is different from the auditory canal, from the nares and so on. Everything is different. We look at just the fungi that live everywhere. The respiratory tract, yes, if these get too abundant, then we have a significant infection, but this is normally there. The urinary tract and the vaginal canal are, many of these things are normally there. Candidia, if it becomes out of control, then it's a condition. But these things are normally there. And what often happens to put these into dysbiosis, if we're taking a antibiotics for a cold, it might wipe out the vaginal canal in terms of different fungus. And suddenly it's nothing but candidia. And that's a yeast infection, if you will. So don't worry about all these particular species, aspergillus is bread fungus, don't worry about that. But these, many of these can be pathogenic depending on where they are, but they're part of our healthy situation. And these are the things, even in the mouth, dental caries are caused by bacteria. Bad breath, as we all know, is caused by bacteria. Yeast infections are what we would call thrush. If you take antibiotics for a sore throat, you may end up with a yeast infection in your mouth. Mothers and fathers may have seen this. It's called thrush. We don't see it too much anymore. I love this. This is just a hair follicle. This is the follicle. There's the shaft. All of this is fungi. All of this is bacteria. Right there, right there. Yeah, I can hear him. Horton hears a fungi. Viruses, those are bad guys, right? No, look, everywhere. The virome, meaning the viral part of our microbiology, our microbiome. These are everywhere, all the systems. They seem at sometimes to control the harmful. There are specific viruses that only attack bacteria. So if we knew what bacteria was making us sick, we could take that bacteriophage and take that as medicine. Europe has been doing this for a long time, but you know it's kind of hard to convince people, hey, take this virus, it will help you, it'll get better. Plus, we do have parasites. I don't want to scare anyone, we do have parasites. You don't often hear about them, and we don't know about the commensal forms. We know about the nasty ones. You drink water in the Sierra Nevada, you're most likely to get Giardia, which is going to be a very difficult thing to get rid of it because antibiotics don't work for amoebas. This is an amoeba. It's a flagellate here. This is an amoeba. Uh, I saw this a couple times as a kid because we, I spent my life swimming in canals and mine holes and rivers. Well, there's a amoeba that lives there. We used to just call it Pam because that's the word we heard. Sometimes if it gets into your nose, it will just eat its way through the cribriform plate and right up into your frontal lobe. And uh, it causes what looks like meningitis, but it's an amoeba inside your brain eating away. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Plus there's all these other things, another amoeba, entamoeba. Cryptosporidium, oh, giardia. You'll know if you have giardia and it's difficult to treat. All these other things, flukes, worms, so on. You don't want to know that we are covered with these things. These are worms, different worms, helminths. Isn't that a wonderful word? That just means worms. <laughs> Having just come from Japan, I was very cautious because I know this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little tapeworm. It doesn't look like a tapeworm, but 
when it gets in, it will go and it passes through people as a different life history gets into the fish. And when you eat these things, these come out again as little worms. This is the thorax. This is the trunk. This is the brain. And there are all of these little tapeworms, Japanese broad tapeworm. It will make you think twice about eating sushi again. Anyway, 90% of people in Japan basically had this little nathostomia stoma. You know about ecosystems. Well, this is a simple ecosystem talking about some place like in Canada. And there's a lot of symbiotic relations. But this is the ecosystem <laughs> we're trying to understand in us. This is our ecosystem. And all right, if you follow some of this gut bacteria out, you see, especially from the colon, it produces vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin B, a bunch of different things. So automatically, these things are beneficial, at least to our vitamin needs. But just try to understand all of this. <laughs> and the byproducts are in blue, but we wouldn't have a lot of meat to eat without these kinds of things, cows and sheep and goats and so on, and pigs. They have multiple stomachs, four stomachs. And in each of these stomachs, especially the rumen, which is the big fermenting fat, this is made up of 10 million individual kinds of bacteria. How many fungi? 10,000 or so. We wouldn't have meat if we weren't for this because they can't digest grass without this. Now, this is a very tricky thing, but I'll try to make it painless. <laughs> this is a bacteria a nucleus, but bacteria have a secondary nucleus, a little tiny floating piece of DNA circular called a plasmid. And once in a while, this plasmid will copy itself and then send a piece of it to its neighbor. And that neighbor will pass a piece on to the next one. So if you follow this, it copied this piece, sent it on, and it made it all the way to all the neighbors. Sadly, what usually bacteria do, they copy their antibiotic resistance gene and pass it on. This is one of the problems with taking so many antibiotics. We force the bacteria to do this. And in the long run, the bacteria become resistant to that an antibiotic because what have they done? They've evolved and they pass their genes on, not through sex, but horizontally, just by plasmid transformation. Now, bacteria can have a form of sex, they do the same thing. Here's the plasmid. Well, sometimes they, they kiss, they make a little tube, and then they make a copy of the whole plasmid and then send that off to the next cell. So it's kind of like sex. This one we call the positive cell. This is negative because it's unfulfilled. And then we pass it on. That becomes positive. This is horizontal gene transfer. This is what these bacteria are doing all the time inside they're getting antibiotic resistance. And bacteriophages, which are virus, I mean, these are trippy. If you saw this, you'd think, oh, Star Wars. No, these are what bacteriophages look like under an electron microscope. And what they do is they land just, you know, they have a landing capsule. And then they inject, see this little thing there? They inject their own DNA into the host. And they'd like to just do this to bacteria, thankfully. And so now there's a viral DNA that goes either into the host DNA or makes it a plasmid. And this can pass on, pass on, pass on. Oftentimes it will kill the host bacteria, but we're experimenting with using bacteriophages to kill bacteria in us. So this is what's called transduction, and it goes on all the time. Virus is passing. Uh, they do it to us, by the way. And 
if they go from us to another one of our cells, they take a piece of our DNA with them. So there's an evolutionary scenario going inside our gut, our mouth, our armpit. Guys are changing DNA and RNA and they're mutating. If we wash too much, <laughs> you may not like this lesson, but we do wash too much. We use too much caustic and antibacterial substances that we make ourselves relatively sterile and we change what lives on us. And who knows what comes and inhabits us may not be that friendly. You hear about psoriasis all the time, but they don't want to tell you that you can probably treat your psoriasis by probiotic uses. Now, I'm going to tell a little story. I'll make it very, very quick. Toxoplasma gondii. It's a little protozoan. It lives in animals, but it can also live in water. It's found worldwide, but once it's defecated, sometimes it passes into another host. So if there's feces in the soil, someone's playing with it, or if someone eats it, you know your dogs, you know cats, you know everything. Cockroaches, they all eat feces. Little kids eat feces. So it's possible for this thing, which is had, this looks like an alien spaceship because it has this little structure. Once it gets in your gut, it will go from your gut into cells. And then a bunch of them will form in there. And now you have a form, a cyst, which can live indefinitely all of your life. This is the most widely spread human parasite. Six billion people, there's only seven billion people, may be infected with this. Most of the time, it just makes a cyst and doesn't do anything. Now, <laughs> this is the fascinating thing about toxoplasmosis. The cat goes to the bathroom. Here are the toxoplasmus cysts in the soil. And a mouse comes along, likes to eat that. Pig will eat that. All sorts of things. A human may come and clean the cat box and inhale this or comes in through the skin. Now toxoplasmosis is in the human. So guys or gals never clean the cat box, especially if you're pregnant, because the toxoplasmosis can get into the fetus can also get it through transfusions. But anyway, what does this do? The fascinating thing about this, <laughs> it changes the brain of rats and mice, and they lose their fear of cats. And in fact, they become attracted to feline urine. Hi, you're a cat. I'm a mouse. And what happens? The cat eats the mouse and it gets infected. And so if it ever defecates in the cat box, now toxoplasma is there. <laughs> this is fascinating. See, this is what science does. They infected hyenas. <laughs> and the hyenas would approach lions that were infected. Oh, you're a lion. Hmm, that's neat. And guess what happens? This parasite, wants to survive. So what it does is it changes the host brain so that it loses fear and gets eaten and thence passes it along. How much does this happen in nature? We don't know, but toxoplasma is in virtually everyone. People can get it just eating undercooked meat, but you can get it from water or soil that's been mixed up with fecal matter from all sorts of things, or it also can come from transfusion, but don't worry, and transplacentally from mother to fetus. I knew of a case in Pacific Grove where a kid was playing in the sandbox in the backyard, and the sandbox was very popular among the neighborhood raccoons. Everything is popular in Pacific Grove to raccoons. Anyway, this kid got a severe encephalitis from this and it took a long time before they figured it out. Toxoplasmus in humans, for some reason, makes them more attractive, <laughs> but it also makes them reckless. So we know that it affects behavior. 
And it may, in the long run, have something to do with epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. But you're never going to look for these cysts if <laughs> there's no other symptom. But we know that guys who are infected by this drive too fast are in more car accidents, just like the rat that was not afraid of the cat. So here is a parasite that changes our behavior and also can induce depression. It may be responsible for autism. We don't know. And look at the, the sample size, 5 billion people. Who's going to look for this? And also it's associated with certain cancers. Where is the microbiome? And I just mentioned Phil Marsh, who's at Leeds, and he realized that most dentistry and most diseases come about from bacteria. So it's not the brushing, uh, and by the way, toothbrushes are you know, only a couple hundred years old and people didn't do anything, so their teeth fell out. And the bacteria that get in, they're there anyway, but they can form a film, as you know. You know if you don't brush your teeth that day, it gets a film. Eventually that film, and, and this is a very crucial thing called biofilm that bacteria will do to protect themselves. If you leave that biofilm, they may actually calcify the film, and that's tartar. So what you're brushing is to try to disturb the bacteria, and if you deep clean and floss, you're trying to get rid of the plaque and the tartar down there. The mouth, as we know, <laughs> gets us in a lot of trouble, and it is one of the most complex in terms of the diversity of microbiota. It has viruses, it has bacteria, it has fungi, it has all these different things. Plus we put everything in our mouth. We smoke, we drink, no wonder. Dentistry is one of the oldest professions because our teeth have suffered from this and they still suffer from this. And recently people have been beginning to figure this out. I mean, here is biofilm, by the way. You can see this and you can see it here. This is a bacterial film. Now, bacteria, once they get on, they, they have a, a gelatinous coat and they can stick to anything. And once they get to the coat, they begin to release chemicals called quorum sensors. They say, hey, I found a good place, Harry, come join me. And then more and more pile up. They now alter their gelatinous covering. They can make it sealed and resistant to antibiotics, and then periodically they disperse it. So biofilm or dental plaque. Biofilm is very dangerous. We can get biofilms in our blood. So here, in fact, what you've heard of an atheroma or arterial sclerosis, this is a biofilm. You can get it in a catheter, you can get it in your mouth, and you can also get it growing on a hip replacement or a knee replacement. And look what it can do over time to your teeth. And you see these all the time. You want to know what biofilm is, go out and put your finger into the end of the water hose. And it will be slippery. That's biofilm. Now imagine those inside us. And so this is what the hardening of the arteries is caused by bacteria inside of us. So here are the quorum sensors, which is really unusual. You wouldn't think bacteria could talk to each other, but they do. And they cooperate and they build this film. And it's very complex film, as I said, resistant to antibiotics. Resistance, um, often, this is why flossing is more important because it breaks up these biofilms a little bit. So there are about a thousand, <laughs> think of that, just a thousand species of uh, bacteria, and they can include old ones, and these are all the different types of bacteria, and these spirochetes and these are actually protozoans. My goodness, and we're now suspecting that some of these can contribute to diabetes, cystic fibrosis. We're not sure the links, but we find, so if you take a diabetic and look at their mouth, there's a dysbiosis in their mouth. We're in the early stages of this paradigm shift. We really don't know what's going on. Look at the skin, look at this. 
we are a geography. We're a topography. We have an oily face. Then it gets dry. Then it gets moist. And then it's moist there. Then it's moist. Then it's dry. And then it's dry. And then it's disgusting. I mean, because we put a sock on them, then we stuff them in some rubber thing, and then we pound on them and we sweat. And look what happens to the foot microbiome. And here, individuals do differ significantly. But if you look at bacteria over different people, they're pretty much the same. But if you get fungus in here, if you've been an athlete taking lots of showers, I mean, I have such bad tolio, it's disgusting, actually. So even disbalance in the skin will cause an allergic reaction, what is called an atopic skin. So many of the skin eczemas or psoriasis actually have to do with what's in the gut. Now, how do you figure that out? How do you correct it? This is the upper respiratory tract. Boy, we got a lot of things. Why aren't we sick all the time? Because these control harmful ones, unless we do a nasal lavage. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. But anyway, and then here is the respiratory system. There are already, look at all these different bacteria down there. And they can, can prevent normal infection, uh, prevent normal inflammation, and they help the immune system develop. So this is our normal situation. And then here is the, well, the GI tract going all the way down. And this will show you a little bit of where things are. And it also will show the environment changes. There's more oxygen up here and then eventually it becomes uh, without oxygen and you get what are anaerobic bacteria. And the pH changes. The pH is almost as acidic here. It's about two. But then when you get down here, it gets much more basic. So, there are different kinds of bacteria, but don't worry about this. You can, even doctors aren't aware of this because many people have not taken bacteriology. They don't know the difference between a bacterioidetes or formiculites or formicutes, but there are lots of different ones. Now, this is a kind of important thing to learn, colony forming unit. How do we measure these bacteria in abundance? Well, Normally, when you're playing with bacteria, you have a little sample, you put it on a, an auger plate. This is a nutrient-rich sterile plate. You put a little bit of this on, and then you see how many colonies there are. You have to count them. Actually, Hewlett Packard has a machine that will count the bacterial colonies for you. So if a little tiny bit of this from your colon, when you plate it out, can form 10 to the 10th colonies, that's a lot, or 10 to the 12. So this is a difficult concept, colony forming unit. It just tells you the concentration of bacteria. So if you look up in the small intestine, it's only about 10,000. Down here, it goes up to billions. Here's another way of looking at it. Going from here down to 10,000, down to 10 million in the colon, down to 100 million bacteria per milliliter. I will talk a little bit at length about the fact that there is a giant nerve that goes all around the intestinal tract and comes up and goes into the brain. This is called the vagus nerve, not Las Vegas, V-A-G-U-S. And it's one of the most important things because, as I mentioned, all sorts of things are produced by these bacteria in the colon, in the small intestine, including serotonin and dopamine and a bunch of other things, melatonin. And these things then ride the vagus nerve up to the brain and influence the brain's development. So that we now know that a lot of depression is due to what's happening in the colon. Neurogenitive disorders, Alzheimer's, autism, we think this is really strongly related to what's in the gut. And I'll come back to this. Autism, we can see the bacteria change.
going from Clostridium and Candida down to Bifidobacteria. And when we see autism develop, and you know what it is, it also has a lot of neuroinflammation with immunosubstances, interleukins, if you remember those. Now, you will hear a lot about leaky gut. It is not a real medical condition. The gut can be made more permeable, but to call it leaky gut is not correct. We know that the microbiome is associated with Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and also celiac disease, but it's also associated with a lot of other things. So this is one of my messages. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> I don't want to say charlatan, but I will say charlatan. There will be so many people who are trying to sell you something. If they're selling you something like leaky gut revive, you've never even heard of leaky gut. They'll even give you diagrams. It's not a medical condition. Irritable bowel is. But who's going to say? Eh, it's not in the diagnostic or statistical manual. Here, your gut cleanse guru. <laughs> Zupu, all he is selling you, if you read all the ingredients in here, all of these things are indigestible, and especially bentonite. Bentonite is a clay that's used to coat Hollywood building blocks and so on. So you're just eating very expensive laxatives, $30 a bottle for this stuff. And there's nothing beneficial about it. This brings me in mind of colonic irrigation, cleansing. We've always thought cleansing is the way to health. So here are machines carefully developed. You sit down, you squat over a nozzle, and they adjust soapy hot water, and they flush it out. And look, they take an x-ray, and then what do they get? Look at what they get. Oh, my goodness, this is, that's inside you. Yes, you know what that is? That's your biofilm microbiome. It's been flushed out by colonic therapy. And occasionally you even get gallstones coming out with this stuff. It doesn't kill anyone. So the FDA says it's fine. And you want to know who invented this, among others? One of my favorite charlatans, Harvey Kellogg. And you would go to Battle Creek for his hospital to go through that treatment. So beware, my students used to call it Lookenbach's law of expertise. Namely, the less we know about something, the more experts you'll find. You may have heard about this man, Andrew Whitefield. He wrote a book. He did science, not good science. In fact, the science eventually was revoked. He's the one who said mercury and multiple vaccines are causing autism. He's the one. And all it took was a spokeswoman because her child was autistic. They joined forces. They eventually fell in love. They toured the United States because he lost his license in England, opened up a hospital here because we don't care. And they're responsible for more unvaccinated children in the United States than anyone else. And this science was refuted over and over again. And you don't hear about that. You don't hear about that. I used to show this to my students all the time when I'd ask them, okay, it says that people are living longer. This is the death rate over the last 100 years. Okay, so the death rate has declined. And of course, everybody would say, well, antibiotics. Well, only halfway through this was the first antibiotic used during the Second World War. So what actually did this? Well, the first thing that did this was sanitation, <laughs> indoor plumbing, and plumbing in general. But notice that we're dying of different things. Almost all of this is from infectious diseases, infectious diseases. Now, what we see multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, diabetes, asthma, heart disease, obesity. We're dying of different things than we were 100 years ago. Why? Well, this is Dr. Strachan from 
St. George's University of London. And he practiced out in the country and then he practiced in the city. And what he saw is all of these diseases were very common in urban dwellers. So he analyzed all of his former patients and then his patients in the city. And he said that, you know, rural people had larger families. They were exposed to all sorts of worms and infections. They had very little exposure to antibiotics, but high farming exposure and high levels of exposure to the environment. Well, what happens when you move to a city and what happens in you go to a more modern lifestyle, a small family size, you don't get exposed to bacteria, you don't get exposed to worms, animals, and so on. He says, we're too clean. This is another guy, Martin Blazer. He's analyzed antibiotic resistance and the use of antibiotics in the last 50 years. We overprescribe it, we overuse it, and it destroys not what we're after, but everything. And it's also leading to multiple drug resistance. So two things, we are living in an antiseptic environment and we overuse antibiotics. And what do we see now? Not infectious diseases, but what we call non-communicable diseases which I mentioned, and this is happening around the world. As people get more urbanized and higher levels of living, they want to have not just indoor plumbing, but you know, sanitized Lysol and antibiotics, cleaning everything. So all of these things, uh, pulmonary disease, obesity, arterial sclerosis, diabetes, Crohn's disease, all of these things are non communicable diseases, you're not going to give your diabetes to anyone, but your brother and your sister are very likely to develop it because they're not exposed to anything. This is another paradigm shift. We're too clean. Without our old friends, the bacteria, we don't get a very good immune response to things. And then if we're overstressed and poorly nourished, we have a diminished immune regulation. In fact, I read a lot, unfortunately, and I throw this in because it was a very interesting discovery, a mycobacterium that was found in the soil actually produces serotonin. So if you garden, not only do you feel good gardening, you also get an input of serotonin. Now a company is trying to isolate this particular serogenetic system. So we've always known. I mean, I spend a good part of my summer farming, literally, and it's always a fun time, even though it's kind of hot and miserable. I love this. This was taken by a friend of mine up in Cabrillo teaching microbiology, and I used to suggest this. It's a big plate, nine-year-old boy who just put his hand on an augurized plate, sterile, and then they incubated it. This is his hand. Isn't that Beautiful. <laughs> and what do we do? Wash our hands, wash our hands. We're not surgeons. Come on. So we're living pretty much in a germ-free environment, and we don't have much contact with older siblings or even in daycare and so on. My mother's allergic to biodiversity. Well, and if you want to go in depth about this, you can look at how we sanitize our skin. James Hamblin has this very nice book. It's in the bibliography. Also, we understand this now because there's multiple, uh, which are called omics. What are the genes? Genomics. How do they work? Transcriptomics. Uh, what do they make? Proteomics. What kind of metabolic products are these? Metabolomics. All of these things are new sciences, and all of these come to focus on microbiome. So in 2008, the National Institutes of Health set a five-year project and sampled people from all over the world. There were two phases of this, and they were doing all of these omics. They were doing metatranscriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and all these other things, plus microbolomics. <laughs> and this is what they found. 10,000 different organisms were found in and on uh, the human body. And 
Everybody in the world has them. Of course, they're going to be influenced by diet and antibiotic use, but the type of birth, what way were you delivered? Since then, the NIH has expanded. They've gotten more money, so they're focusing on different aspects like irritable bowel syndrome and a bunch of other things like that. So we now know that vaginal delivery is healthy because as the baby comes out, it's exposed not only to vaginal bacteria, but also rectal bacteria. And then eventually induce some of the gut bacteria. If you have C-section, this changes completely. So C-section babies, they're almost sterile, but they get the wrong bacteria. And that won't balance for a long time. Actually, about three years it takes for the baby's gut microbiome to balance itself. So I've read cases where doctors who have their own babies through C-section, they wipe themselves down. And then one of the first things they did is wipe the baby with all of this. <laughs> so that the baby would have a normally formed microbiome, plus milk, glycerol monolaurate, which is an antibiotic naturally found in milk, not to mention there are, guess what, microbacteria. All of these are found in breast milk. So if the baby is not nursed or nursed with artificial milks, the formulas, they don't get this stuff. So the child's microbiome will be very different depending on how it's born and will change over time. By about uh, three years, it will be normal. And then what happens? You'll get an adult form that is different depending on the diet, what foods you eat, where you, what kind of work. And then as we age, it will change again. So to answer one of the questions, the gut microbiome changes during our lifetime. It's individual to us, but it's also common to our family, common to our culture, common to our countries. And it has been used to identify individuals. Because of aging, because of our decline in immune response, there will be age-related microbiotic changes, and we'll see all sorts of things change as we get older and they're more likely to get skin conditions and infections and also GI conditions. And the GI conditions will show up often as constipation or irritable bowel. The microbiota can change over a couple of days. So here are days. These show the changes in microbiota over four days, depending on what they were eating. So if they were strictly vegetarian or strictly strictly meditarian, their microbiome would change. So not only does it change over time, it can change within a week, depending on our diet. And that's, that's a crucial thing. Now, not only does it depend on our diet, it also depends on our grandmother. And this is another paradigm change. How our grandparents live and how our parents live will affect how the genes are expressed in us. And this may go through several grandparents. So we know that an obese mother, the baby will be born with proteins turning off certain metabolic genes so that the baby will, and it grows up to, more likely to be depressed, anxious, have lower cognitive ability, and maybe autism spectrum. But we don't like to look at that. In fact, <laughs> autism may simply be due to the weight of the mother. It's also, we know it's correlated with the age of the mother and what's happening now. Women are working, going to school longer, working and delaying childbirth and often only having one or two children, which is a problem in say Japan, for instance. Well, all of these contribute to depression, anxiety, and autism. 
So a lot of people say, we don't know what causes it. Yes, we do know what causes it, or at least contributes. It may not be the ultimate thing. It may be the microbiome, maybe the factor of obesity, and it may be the factor of who your grandmother was too. So the fact that the environment of our grandparents, what they ate, what they smoked, and so on, will influence our gene expression is known as epigenetics. And we found out about this by looking at a very severe Dutch hunger winter in 1945, when 20,000 people died, but almost all of them became malnourished when the Nazis cut off all food supplies to Holland. And so anyone who survived there had genes that were activated to try to put on fat as much as they could. So the survivors of these people, and we can do the same study in Navajo because they went through a starvation episode and they come out and their DNA is changed and they become obese as grandchildren or even as children. This looks like Audrey Hepburn and Audrey Hepburn survived that in Holland and later had severe health problems all of her life because she survived this. So we can see how the gut changes whether the person is normal weight or an obese and the baby ends up with whatever the mother's gut bacteria are because it will cross the placenta. So obesity is a major problem and you can see the change in the mother and ultimately in, in the baby and there's metabolic outcomes. They will be more insulin resistant. They'll have more adiposity that is more fat. So what does the microbiome do for us? Lots of things, good things and bad things. The gut itself, we now we know in detail that it makes a number of B vitamins and also K, which is essential for blood clotting and so on. And the gut is actually one of the largest immune organs and it's dealing with bacteria all the time. So it helps our immune system develop. And the gut also produces what are called short chain fatty acids which I'll talk about in a minute, because those get converted into neurotransmitters. It's the gut that makes serotonin more than the brain. 90% of it produced by the gut and dopamine, which is a reward neurotransmitter. So it does a lot of things. The microbiota in our lungs protects against regular infections. The skin helps in wound healing and inflammation control. And the brain, it's the activation of the vagus nerve, which is very, very important. It also produces folate and biotin along with this, as well as absorbed vitamin K. So there's a lot of benefits. And we're only now beginning to understand all of these. They have antioxidant effects. They regulate the heart. This is sometimes called the gut-brain hypothesis. Some people call it the gut is the second brain. Now, one of my wives used to say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And then I would say, yeah, and do south. But the gut does influence the brain because it controls the nutrient delivery, the microbial balance, the secretion of neurotransmitters. And also the important thing is the motility which becomes a problem for lots of elderly and also even young people these days because they don't drink enough and they have microbiomes that lead to constipation. But here is the vagus nerve, the efferent coming from the gut, going to the brain and going to the area that serotonin and dopamine will activate. And this has a feedback because the vagus will then go back to the liver, the spleen and every place else. There have been some studies that said, well, we looked at people all over the world and we find some people are dominated by bacterioids and they tend to be more meat eaters. Some people are dominated by this and, and some people by this and these are more vegetarian. Well, you'll read about enterotypes and there'll be books about it and so on. It's even interesting to look when we go back into prosimian ancestries 
we see that the microbiomes change completely, especially with Provotella changing as we come along. We can look at different cultures in the Western diet and see what happens to their immune system. A lot of people know that the Mediterranean system is closer to a balanced system than any other place on the planet. Also, the Mediterranean system has been recognized as one that accentuates longevity and health. This is the vagus system. And these are all branches of the vagus nerve. It goes up and then as two branches, this is a cranial nerve that comes off. It's very, very important. And one of the secondary things that happens with this is making these what are called short-chained fatty acids. These are made in the gut, in the colon, and each of these in turn are made into serotonin, melatonin, which affects your mood and your sleep, and also dopamine, which is the reward system. So we know now that it's highly associated with functionality. Dopamine is made through these short chain fatty acids and on to melatonin. Serotonin, by the way, is also influenced by daylight, how much daylight your eye gets and falls on your brain. So that's one of the reasons we feel better in the summer. And then melatonin is selectively made in the winter when we're not getting as much light. In fact, this is a recognized condition called seasonal affective disorder known as SAD. So people in Alaska, for instance, have grow lights in their offices. So they increase the amount of serotonin produced to make serotonin, you need tryptophan. It's a precursor. So you go way up here to L-tryptophan. That's just made into hydroxytryptophan. Another enzyme makes it into serotonin. And then another enzyme will make it into melatonin. But we need more serotonin normally. So you all know about turkeys and people getting sleepy after a big turkey meal. Well, you're not used to eating 6,000 calories in the middle of the afternoon. Of course, everyone's going to want to just fall asleep on the couch. It's not the tryptophan per se, it's the total calories. But fish and milk, lentils, beans, grains, seeds, nuts, soya, very high in tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, and most antibiotics are trying to increase the serotonin in your nerve synapses. In fact, what's Prozac, but a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor it's trying to increase the serotonin in the nerve gap. You need B3 to turn tryptophan into niacin, which is a central vitamin that helps us absorb iron and B6. The immune system all along the way has special little lymphoidal tissues. So it's getting bathed by bacteria and releasing immunoglobulins, interleukins and other kinds of globulins. These are looking at the lymphoidal tissue in the small intestine and in the gut. So these are all marked by special immunofluorescent dyes and showing you the widespread amount of immune tissue in our gut. Here's another view and it shows that all of these immune cells all along the small intestine and all along the large intestine as what are called Peyer's patches. Now, is everyone's the same? No, <laughs> but if you look at twins, they're gonna be very, very close because they grew up in the same household, the same environment, they ate the same foods, they probably played with each other. If they had a pet, they shared the pet. Households with pets have fewer allergic children. Simple, because you're exposed to so much, right? It's not to say they can't develop an allergy later, but if they were exposed early, they probably won't develop it later to a, say, dog or cat. Now, take home messages. How to maintain a healthy microbiome? <laughs> take probiotics. Probiotics are living bacteria that are inactivated. Bacteria can form a, a resistant 
quiet cyst. So a powder, if you will. So you can take those and you can eat fermented foods because fermented foods like kefir, kimchi or miso or sauerkraut or tempeh have living bacteria in them. And one of the things in the past, how do we preserve food? We fermented it. We turned it into you know, sauerkraut and things like that. I grew up eating sauerkraut. Now we have to buy it. You have to pay a lot of money for kimchi or something like that. If you want, you can do that or just make your own sauerkraut. I'll tell you, red cabbage sauerkraut is great. <laughs> just had a flash of going in Moscow one time, and this was actually in Riga somewhere. This is a Riga picture over here. And you see school kids and everybody else, and they stop and they get a mug of kvass. And kvass is made by, at home by everybody. And you made the leftover rye bread, you put it in a big jar, put it on the table, leave it open, yeast comes in, you cover it up, see it's covered up, and you let it ferment. And it turns the carbohydrate of the rye bread into a wonderful refreshing drink. They call it kvass, they've been making it forever. You can take this kvass and later ferment it. <laughs> turns into a lovely liqueur called Bazam. But kvass, I mean, the school kids stop and drink it. You can make it yourself. Eat prebiotic. This is where science defines, right? Commercial people don't define. <laughs> so be careful. Prebiotic means it's indigestible. Why would you eat something that your bacteria can't digest? Well, they like to digest things slowly. So if it's indigestible, it encourages beneficial bacteria to multiply. So bread has a lot of prebiotic fiber, chicory root, bananas, asparagus, artichokes, onions, garlic, all of these uh, whole grains. So another thing, sugar is not very good because one, it doesn't take much to digest sugar. It's also absorbed more in the stomach and the, and the small intestine, less in the colon. Artificial sweeteners are mostly proteins or alcohols, and they're not necessarily nutritious and they're not helpful. In fact, one of the interesting findings is that people who use artificial sweeteners tend to cheat elsewhere. Just like people who drink soft drinks that are diet said, well, I, <laughs> I can have that hamburger tonight because I had two diet drinks today. No, it doesn't work that way. You can't nickel and dime yourself. There are resistant starches like green bananas. There is fiber, but the, some of the starches in general are a little bit more resistant. It takes longer to digest these. So these are beneficial in terms of bacteria. Reduce your stress, it doesn't sound right, but it will affect. There have been a lot of studies on stress and gut health. Exercise, of course. Exercise is good for everything. Athletes tend to have a larger variety of microflora, and they might also eat differently, which is not always easy to determine. Get enough sleep, because studies have shown less sleep, and it will decrease Beneficial microflora, it also increases the risk of inflammation. Use different <laughs> cleaning products. I can't believe, you know, but, oh, this is going to kill 99% of your house. <laughs> Do we really need to bathe everything in ammonia or antibiotics? It just uh, avoid smoking, obviously. We know that gut flora will change, stomach flora will change in smokers is strongly linked to inflammatory bowel disease, not to mention all the cancers. A vegetarian diet is what humans evolved with. We came from chimps who are vegetarian. <laughs> Early traditional peoples were vegetarian. Avoid taking unnecessary antibiotics. I know this is hard and it's estimated that 30% of the antibiotics aren't necessary. Now, if this doesn't work for you, I got an option. You can eat your own feces or you can process it yourself. There is a thing known as FMT, 
fecal microbiota transplantation. You collect it, you can process it, you can dry it out. And if you dry it out, it's one. I don't recommend doing it this way. You can, I'm telling you, it is done in many parts of the world. You can filter it and then you can make it into a pill or liquefy it and take it as an enema, or you can actually use a device and just put it up the rectum. Probably drinking it wouldn't do anything. But we know this itself will prevent many, many things. This is done in hospitals and in certain clinics, but you could do it at home. It can be done at home. Just blend it, mix it, filter it, and so on. Capsules or stool. You can't buy this. You need to have someone who's familiar with you, close to you. In some cases, they prepare the bowel by taking a course of antibiotics. This is the routine treatment of Clostridium difficilis. Here you can see it in a colostomy or in a syringe. This is 90% effective for C. diff. And C. diff is one of the nastiest bacteria. It's a nosocomal bacteria. You mostly get it in the hospital after some sort of treatment. And it's often very common for elderly people or post-surgical people to get this and not know they have it. They'll develop fever. So the treatment prescribed is fecal transplant. Other things may be treated by this in extreme cases. There are many studies, especially in Europe and England, we're a little bit more fecophobic but this is used to treat idiopathic and thrombocytic arteriosclerosis, multiple sclerosis, fatty liver, obesity, and insulin resistance type 2 diabetes. One of the worst forms of nutrition is you see these pictures of kids' bloated bellies. It doesn't mean that they have food in the bellies. They are swelling. Their tissues are leaking out cytoplasm, and they are swelling up. This is called edematous malnutrition, and it's a protein deficiency. And this has been demonstrated that once a child is in this stage, you need to somehow bring them back slowly by bringing their microbiota back. And a couple of products have been developed, Ruft, which is now used by UNICEF to treat people. And it's been proof of concept showing it working with mice and so on. So this is now available to allow kids to actually come back. But Quashia core kids, their whole gene contact will shut down and their microbiota will shut down. <laughs> Notobiotic mice, these <laughs> are unbelievable, but they have given us a lot of insights. That is, they are taken cesarean section out of their mother, put into a sterile environment, raised by a sterile foster mother, and then subjected to all kinds of wonderful things a scientist can think of. But if you take a, a sterile mouse, it can't absorb any of the food you give it. In fact, their intestines won't be very long. They won't be able to develop vitamins, and they're very, very susceptible to any kind of pathogen. So they're sterile. Of course, they're not going to th thrive. These are like quashia core man-made mice, and they really are man-made. This is a facility that I visited once in Johnson Labs in Bar Harbor, Maine, but these are notobiotic mice, and you can do all sorts of things. You can stick things in, take them out, and see what particular bacteria does form and you can feed them a certain kind of food. So lots and lots of research. And one of the fascinating things, if you take a lean mouse and you give it feces or inject it through a syringe into the rectum, into a germ-free mouse, it will end up obese. There is epigenetics, right? The obese mouse is going to give those genes, that kind of bacteria to them. If you take gut microbes from a lean mouse, put it in a lean mouse, it's going to stay the same. And if you do this with people, it's the same. You take a monozygotic, same embryo. You take feces from her, give it to a germ-free mouse, 
and it turns into an obese mouse. You can take the gut bacteria from mice are the same as people, so you can transplant them. You don't want to do it backwards. You might get hairy and with a funny tail, but if you take it from a lean person, put it into a lean mouse, it will stay lean. So fecal transplants will epigenetically change the, the recipient according to what the donor was like. And boy, they do all sorts of things with these. This is how we understand it. You can use your imagination. <laughs> and like I said, it, it was done with obese twins and lean twins. And then you can regulate the food. If there is a father of the microbiome, it's Jeffrey Gordon. He's published over 500 papers, and he was father of figuring a lot of this. He worked with gut, basically. Everyone says that probiotics won't do any harm. Well, a number of studies have shown they can do harm. You can get infections, you can get allergic reactions to adverse effects of probiotic consumption. So I'm giving you a caveat, if you want to take probiotics, it may take some time to work and it's not going to be a miracle and some people will react. You may feel bloated and that's fine. You may develop other sorts of things, but there's research to say that probiotics are not absolutely benign. And yet, if you take them and you start them, you'll probably get some side effects initially, bloating and diarrhea, very common. But be careful. Because they're so safe and have very side effects, you can take probiotics with essentially no risk of serious side effect. This is from a website. When I just showed you the scientific study saying, yes, you can have effects. And I like this book. And who is Marty? Marty's a CCN. All it means is he's somehow associated with Medicare or Medicaid, I don't know. It doesn't mean he's a closed caption nurse or something. I don't know what that means, but he's selling the book. But if you've sometimes had a large dose of antibiotics, this is helpful. If you have chronic constipation, probiotics are helpful. And if you have normal digestive complaints or irritable bowel syndrome, you should take them and be careful with it. How much should you take? <laughs> 300 billion? Remember, these are colony forming units. You should probably start with something uh, between one and a billion, not necessarily 300 billion. If some is good, more must be better. I mean, this, <laughs> this is what companies do. 300 billion. That's got to be better than 100 billion, isn't it? No, this is probably going to really give you diarrhea or who knows. And it's got probiotics and prebiotics. Would you like to take a pill or eat like this? You know, <laughs> probiotics, you should take them on an empty stomach or depending on who you read before breakfast or before you go to bed. You look on the internet, you'll find all sorts of things. They don't give you much help, but most of the reliable places said it's good if you take them before you eat. What are probiotics? The strain should be sufficiently characterized. You don't need to know the strains. You kind of take it on faith. If you want to do your own research and figure out, well, I need bifido, then you can look for that. <laughs> well, this one has 90 million. This one has 40 million. 100 million probably is pretty good. And how do you know which one? And this one gives you bacteria, but it's gluten-free and soy-free. Uh, I'm making fun because there is no control over dietary supplements. There's none whatsoever. All the FDA cares about is, does it kill anyone? So you have to be pretty informed. And not only that, you have to be informed for your dog because they're selling all the dog food now as prebiotic and postbiotic, three in one. What does that mean? Oh, and here, now you have to be concerned with Bernie's perfect poop. <sighs> You're just supposed to pick it up. You don't have to examine it. And again, here's the clamoring of charlatans. This market is estimated at $37 billion. 
And people complain about medical costs. Who's Dr. Danielle? What the, I couldn't find what her degree is in. Anyway, you can read books. I wouldn't recommend any of these. I would recommend Robin Chutkan. She's a bona fide gastroenterologist. She works at uh, Georgetown. She's been on the faculty for quite some time. She's written three easily accessible books. She's legitimate. She has her own digestive center for wellness outside of DC. And these are the three books I would recommend, or actually she has four now. The Microbiome is a good introduction. And I have all of these on the bibliography. But you'll also see postbiotics. Oh my God. And synbiotics. There's no agreement what these are. These, okay, these are synergistic pre and post. And this is postbiotics. What? These are supposed to be the metabolites. Be careful, just read. <laughs> I have to end with this. Swing Ming Park is at Stanford. It takes a picture of your rectum, so you never have to feel alone. It analyzes your urine stream. It checks to make sure you are who you are and you haven't put a fake synthetic rectum over your rectum. It keeps data on your stool, your urine stream, and how much it's coming out. And it looks at your urine stream. It also does a dipstick analysis right here to your urine. And then it stores this. And it also comes with Alexa built in. I mean, I got used to some of these in Japan. They're pretty weird. But these are now available and they come fully equipped, $7,000 on Amazon. The advantage of these, if this comes, and this should come in the future, this could come in the future everyone has a smart toilet. And then the toilets will share information say, oh, this guy has colon cancer. And this guy is positive for COVID. You could do that. You know how we trace COVID across the United States? Water treatment plants. Everyone pees, everyone poops, goes to the water treatment plant. You can find some neighborhoods, but you know now the city. The FDA does this for drugs. Want to see if there's a drug outbreak in this particular area, you go to the water treatment people. It's inappropriate for scientists to let information go unmarked. That 10 to one, that 10% of our body is made up of human cells. This has been reanalyzed. But every book, there'll be book after book saying the 10%. The original myth was done in 1972 by Tom Lucky. It was an estimate, a back of the envelope. It looks more like one to one. So for every human cell, there's a microbial cell somewhere. That's still 70 trillion microbes in us. But I can't let that go. <laughs> Sorry.